And this is Paul planting a church in Corinth. So on his, on his second missionary journey, and this is outlined in Acts 18, he's preaching in a synagogue, Paul's at the synagogue in Corinth, and uh, he gets so frustrated with the opposition and people were just reviling, uh, the, the Jewish leaders in the time reviling him. He shakes out his garments <laughs> he says, your blood be on your own heads, I'm innocent, he storms off. I'm gonna go preach to the Gentiles. I'd rather spend time with people who think, yeah, you see that, that temple up there? I'd rather pre- preach to the people who think that's okay than to preach to you guys, okay? And this is, pastors, we never get frustrated like that, do we? Not, not at all. Right, so... Um, you know, and this is how he ends up, but God uses this frustration, and this is how he ends up planting the church in Corinth. So we'll throw it up there, Acts 18, verses 7 through 11. It says, he left there, and he went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. So Paul shakes off his garment, I'm done with you, and he storms off and goes next door. And that's where he plants the church of Corinth. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, actually, together with his own household, but the other rulers, they were really opposing Paul and, like, threatened to kill him. And many of the Corinthians, uh, Paul believed, uh, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Paul's frustrated, he's fearful for his life. Verse 9, the the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, the Lord comes to Paul in a vision. Paul's so frustrated, he thinks people are going to kill him. Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in the city who are my people. And he, Paul, stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Paul accepted this mission, this this job offer, using his gifts. And because of that, we have a church plant in in Corinth and we have 1 Corinthians. So that's the backdrop here. Years later, Paul finds out that this church is making up kind of their own rules. Okay, they're divided between wisdom and scripture and their own traditions because they're sinful people. They remember they came from a really bad culture. So Paul uh, spends the first 11 chapters of Corinthians correcting them on things like, you know, divisions, human wisdom, Christian services, um, and uh, Christian conduct, impurity, lawsuits, marriage, roles in the marriage, communion. And now in chapter 12, he comes back to spiritual gifts. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, it says, Now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be informed. You know that when you were pagans, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I inform you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different ways of working, but the same God works through all people. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, the workings of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in various tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit who apportions apportions them to each one as he determines. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our worship today, Lord God, that just points to unity and it points to you. We thank you for songs that say things like, what gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer. And and God, we just, we love that. And right now we ask that you you just open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to what you would have us learn here today, God. Guide us by your spirit so that uh, we may be enlightened and encouraged this morning. Let us leave here today with just a deeper understanding of who you are and a growing desire to be used by you for the building up of your church, even in times when it can be frustrating. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Paul begins chapter 12 by reminding the Corinthians at Corinth of their past as non-believers, okay? And he uses that sort of to contrast and to clarify their new relationship with God, particularly the operation of the Spirit of God, okay? They can understand, and we can read scripture that, points to God the Father, we can read the scripture that points to Jesus and how he worked, but there was, a, there was a misunderstanding about how the Holy Spirit works. So he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Paul's saying, hey, remember when you didn't believe Remember when you were led astray by idols? Remember when you put your trust 
time and energy into things that don't speak back? Remember when you had a, maybe a particular worldview that convinced you of lies? You know, last, last Wednesday, our worldview class, they talk about this um, on Wednesday nights. And we looked at worldviews that they, they seem to be true in man's eyes, but in the end are lies. Worldviews that tell people to follow your own heart, to go out in the world and make your own mistakes. You have everything you need to be happy. You don't really need God. What you really need is just a more understanding of yourself. Because in you are all the answers. Just lies, right? Paul reminds them, hey, remember, it used to be this way. But now, as believers, you need to be this way. I want to inform you of the Holy Spirit, Paul says. I don't want there to be any division among you. You are to be the body of Christ, fueled and empowered by his spirit. Be united just as God is united. And I love this because uh, now he is referring to the Trinity. No one who has God's spirit, Holy Spirit, in him can say Jesus, God the Son, and the Greek word there, uh, you know, anathema, cursed, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord unless he has God's spirit in him. God is not divided right? God the Son, God the Spirit, they're not going to say different things. And I love this declaration. It reminds me of Matthew 16 where Jesus asked Peter, uh, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, uh, you are the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you but my Father in heaven, right? So no one can say, Jesus is Lord, believe that, declare it, except those who have the Spirit of God in him. God the Son, God the Spirit. So today as we talk about gifts and different ministries, different ways that God works, I want us to, to see that spotlight that Paul shines on the Trinity. Now, a lot of messages on spiritual gifts that I've heard, they don't really take the time to focus on the Trinity, but Paul absolutely shines a spotlight here. A lot of us think, okay, what's my spiritual gift? You know, how can I use my spiritual gift? And we'll get there. Those are good questions. But we're gonna, um, we'll cover that later. Right now, Paul is shining a spotlight on, the, on these verses, verse 4 through 6. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And that word there, pneuma, pneuma uh, capitalized, is Holy Spirit. And there are varieties of service. Greek word for that is, uh, I'm going to butcher this, but diakonian, which uh, means serving services or serving others, but the same Lord. Greek word there is master, Lord, uh, used for Jesus, what people called him. And there are varieties of activities, um, or effects, or operations, but it's the same God. And that word there, theos, is the word Jesus used uh, to talk about God the Father. So here we have the Trinity. Spirit, Son, God the Father. Um, Paul is choosing to describe the different workings of each person of the Trinity and says they are the same unified God. And this is important because people are divided over spiritual gifts. To this, to this day, people are. We're going to talk about that later. So the goal uh, of... Is, is to unify the church as God is unified. Paul begins to describe the spiritual gifts, which brings us to the first question of the day. What are spiritual gifts? Uh, I'm going to be literal because it's important. So words, you know, definitions can change from generation to generation, but it's important to be literal Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament. That, shouldn't, that doesn't change, right? We don't ever want our interpretation to go sideways from Holy Scripture. So as we talk about what spiritual gifts are, let's just look at the words literally real quick. Greek word for spiritual gifts in verse 1, pneumaticon. Uh, there's another word used for gifts here later in, down in verse 4. Uh, there's a variety of gifts but the same spirit. Now the word here for gifts is charis it's a different word, charismaton, gifts or endowments. And we see this word used um, in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So it's a different word than the spiritual gifts, right? A gift is literally uh, given by the Spirit. We sang today in our worship song, what gift of grace? Jesus, my Redeemer, God gives us grace. Eternal life, though, we don't really put in the spiritual gifts category because we don't really see the manifestation of eternal life. Like, oh, we don't go around saying, I have the spiritual gift of eternal life. Don't really know what that, you know, how the Spirit expresses that. It's true, we do, but we also have God's grace, gift of God's grace, we have the gift of his forgiveness, those are every day, but this, the act of the spirit and the expression of the spirit is what we're going to talk about. And uh, back to verses four uh, to seven, now there are a variety of gifts with the same spirit, and there are varieties of service with the same Lord, varieties of activities but the same God who empowers them all and everyone, and here it is, to each 
is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, that word there, manifestation, um, means expression of the Spirit, the, you know, phanerosis. This is where we start to see spiritual gifts outlined, as a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So eternal life being a gift of God, great, amazing. Thank you, God, if that was the only gift he gave us, that's amazing. But we have expressions of the Holy Spirit actively working here, okay? Manifestations of the the Holy Spirit. Another way to think about it, it is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is within us, okay? So and also in verse 11, uh, these gifts are given by the Holy Spirit to the members of the body of Christ. People who don't believe in God, they do not have the evidence of the Spirit of God because, again, God is not divided, right? You with me? So to answer the question, what are spiritual gifts? Literally, they are gifts from God. We define them as manifestations, expressions, or evidence of the Holy Spirit given by the Spirit to members of the body of Christ, okay? Evidence uh, or expressions of the Holy Spirit given by the Spirit to members of the body of Christ. We're getting literal with this, this definition, okay? Which brings us to our next question. Why? Why are there spiritual gifts? Back in verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Greek word there is a combination of two words. Bear together, make better. Specifically to bear together as believers to make us better as a community of believers, as a body of Christ. Paul goes on in the rest of 1 Corinthians 12 uh, later on to talk about the body of Christ. So skip down to verse 12 for just a moment. For just as the body is one and has many members and all of the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Unity there, right? For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the part of the body but that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. God wants you and I to understand that we all have roles in the body of Christ. There's a picture of the church that God lays out for us. You know, if, if we're all different dots, imagine you're just, you know, just, just different dots. This is you. Maybe you're connected to the church, but maybe you're not. But this is kind of how we see, okay, I'm gonna be connected here. I know this person I know this person, but there's a bigger picture that God wants us to see, and that is that we are connected as a body. One of my favorite things to do when I went to the doctor's office as a kid, I would grab the Highlights magazine, you remember the Highlights magazine? And I'd find the Connect the Dots page, and it starts with this bunch of separate dots that really didn't make any, any picture. You don't see a picture at all, but when you start connecting the numbers to each other and the lines to each other, you start to see the big picture. And that's what I want us to do today. We want you to see yourself as a dot connected to the church, to see the big picture of what God wants to do with you to connect to this body. This is is the why, okay? This is the why God gives us spiritual gifts because he wants to use you, the sinful wretch that you and I are, to build up his church, to make it better and healthy. You need to be a healthy body. If you think you're not worthy to be used by the Spirit, you're right, but neither am I. And the day, actually, that I think I am worthy should probably be my last day in ministry because we're not. We're not worthy. God doesn't need us. He doesn't call us because he needs us. He calls us because he wants us. That's powerful. That that should hit somewhere. He calls you, not because he needs you, because he wants you. If you think God is better off using someone else, to use Lance's favorite quote, quoting Jordan Peterson, think again, sunshine. We'll see how many weeks in a row we get that quote going here in the pulpit. 
I want you to, to see this. God has laid out a job offer for you to be a part of making his church better. And by his spirit, he's already gifted you with the qualifications. I'm gonna say that again. God has laid out a job offer for you to be a part of making his church better, making this church better, the body of Christ better. And his, by his spirit has already gifted you with the qualifications. For those who aren't plugged in here, you're not connected, all you have to do is accept the job offer. If you don't know what your gifts are, that's okay. We're gonna talk about that at the end. But to answer the question of why God gives a spiritual gift, it's what we see in verse seven, for the common good the building up the body to make us better. So we're going to add that to our definition, okay? Spiritual gifts, expressions, or evidence of the Holy Spirit given by the Spirit of the members of the body of Christ for the betterment and building up of the body of Christ. Good so far? Honestly, we could take 16 to 20 weeks talking about spiritual gifts, but I'm just giving you an introduction right now. So we talked about the what, we've talked about the why. Let's talk about the how. How do we see spiritual gifts used today? So if someone were to ask you, what's the difference between someone who is a really good teacher and someone who has the spiritual gift of teaching, what would you say? Do you know what you would say? Let's unpack that a little bit, okay? We're going to skip ahead in 1 Corinthians down to to verse 27. Um, And uh, Paul talks about the body of Christ, uh, and now he's going to talk about gifts being used in the body. Verse 27, now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a member of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then workers of miracles and those with gifts of healing, helping administration and various tongues. All are, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? So we see teachers mentioned here as, as uh, being appointed by God to fill a specific role of the body. Romans 12, 6 to 7, uh, specifically mentions the gift of teaching. Uh, being different from other gifts, but what does it look like? Well, let me give you an example. I love this story. Uh, this is the fifth church I've been on staff at uh, since I, was, I started working in churches when I was 19. So 24 years of ministry, and I worked with lots of different pastors, and uh, there's, a, there's a, um, a symmetry. There's something that's very, very similar to all of them. <laughs> they, they all get really busy during the week, Normally because uh, they're putting out fires, the phone's ringing off the hook because our congregation or staff is constantly calling them. And, uh, but one time, I don't, I don't want to call them out, but honestly, it's probably happened to Lance and every other pastor too. Um, but uh, this happened to, to one of these pastors that I've been on staff with. And uh, one week, they don't even get to the sermon until Saturday. So Sunday rolls around, they're tired, they can barely see their notes. After the service, they're convinced that... Uh, they just delivered the worst message they ever preached. Just a stinker of a message, right? And they shared this with me. So after the service, they're just dreading being in the back and having people coming out to them. And especially the, the, the one person in the church who is constantly critical of their sermon, calling them during the week, being, fact-checking them, you know, that person. And he's like, oh, man, I just know this guy's going to come and just rip my heart open, pull it out, and show it to me. You know, like, oh, this guy. And the person comes up to him, He says, that was your best sermon yet. I was so blessed by your message. Thank you for what you do. And my friend, senior pastor, is going, praise God. (laughs) But in the back of my mind, he's also thinking, well, well, hang on, my best one, really? Oh, that was my best one? What about the the one I spent like weeks working on or this, you know? But that's an example of the gift of teaching because, again, it's an expression of the spirit. God's spirit moved through him. To talk. What, what, what is happening from here to here, I hope, is translating, but from there to you, we are, our prayer is that God's Spirit is, is speaking and working and touching your heart, right? Revealing the Word. So that is where we see this, this expression, and it's just one example of how God manifests the Spirit. But it's a real life evidence that the Spirit is expressing the gift of teaching. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be through a pastor. Gift of teaching can be if, you know, any, if the spirit is moving in, in any of one of our teachers and our, our students are being blessed, right? Then the only explanation is the spirit. That's how we, we, defi- we define because the spotlight is on the spirit, not on the man. And this is key. Paul emphasizes the spotlight being on the spirit. He knows what it's like. Paul experienced this because this happened to him probably more than once, but... 
You remember how frustrated he was when he first planted the church at Corinth? He reminds them of that at the beginning of, of his letter in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He writes this, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Paul is clear here in 1 Corinthians 2 and he's clear in 1 Corinthians 12 that the demonstration of the spirit and the expression of the spirit will always shine the spotlight on the spirit in spite of ourselves. So we don't take any credit for it. That's crystal, crystal clear here. See, how many times he mentions the Spirit here? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12, 8. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith. By the same Spirit, Paul is really driving this home. To another gifts of healing, by the one Spirit. To another workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit. Okay, okay, we get it. We get it, Paul. One of the commentaries I read this week uh, uh, for this passage from Matthew Henry, he has such a great quote, and I want to share it with you. The gifts mentioned here, 1 Corinthians 12, appear to mean exact understanding and uttering the doctrines of the Christian religion, wisdom, the knowledge of mysteries and skill to ad give advice and counsel, gift of knowledge, also the gift of healing of the sick, the working of miracles, and to explain scripture by a particular gift of the spirit, and the ability to speak and interpret languages. If we have any knowledge of the truth or any power to make it known, we must give all glory to God. So how do we see spiritual gifts used today? Expressions or evidence of the spirit given by the spirit to members of the body of Christ for the betterment and building up of the body of Christ that directs all glory back to God. And some of you might be thinking, okay, all right, Steve, I'm in. I feel it. God's calling me to, you know, use the gifts. I get it. I'm not, just not sure what my gifts are, okay? Well, you've come to the right place because one of our goals this year as a church uh, was for you to know what your gifts are and be using them. And we're still nine weeks away from 2024, so we got time. So to help you, we're going to be launching this uh, spiritual gifts assessment. Okay, now this is live. We have printed copies for you in the back, um, but this is live online right now. You can uh, scan that QR code and take it. Don't take the test now, please, but you know, later. We'll, we'll put the slide up at the end. Um, but you can also go to spiritualgifts.windsorchristianchurch.com. There are 96 questions on here, okay? And this is not a definitive this is your thing. This is just a tool to kind of help you decide, again, the gifts that are already given to you, right? Um, it just might help you think a little bit. Of, you identify what you're passionate about and where this is true for you. Each question will have a scale of one to five, uh, one being a statement that's definitely untrue for you, five being this is absolutely true for you. It should take you about 10 minutes, okay? When you're done, you'll click submit. You'll see your results. You'll get an email with your top three outlines of the gifts that you score the highest on. We will also get uh, an email saying what your gifts are as well. Uh, and you have to answer every question or you won't be able to click the submit button. So again, there's 96 of them. But if you don't want to go online, we do have hard copies uh, in the back. They're just attached as a card. We want you to fill out your top three, turn it back to us because we want to know what your gifts are as well because we want to help you use your gifts, again, to build up the body to make us a healthier church. I want to give a huge shout out on this assessment to uh, my fellow brothers and pastors back at Hessel Church. Back in 2016, uh, Pastors Rich, Pastor Ken, Mark, myself, uh, compiled Rich's notes and uh, we researched other assessments uh, to not only come up with uh, you know, the questions, but the, a glossary of the gifts, you know, where they're found in scripture, uh, we included the strengths and weaknesses of each gift. It is, we're so excited about this. And a year after that, in 2017, a member of our church came to me and said, uh, we've got to get this online. I'll cover the cost, but let, let's do it. So um, we hired a web developer, and, six, and here we are six years later, 
This assessment has been uh, used close to, uh, by 17,000 people all over the world. Churches, um, Christian schools have used this, and it went nuts when we put this thing online. I've talked to churches who are from England that use this, and uh, they were just like, this is amazing. So now we have, I worked with a web developer to sort of brand it ourselves for our own church, but uh, if you're watching online you can, uh, and you want this for your church, send us an email, we'll, we can make that happen. Anyway, I've been bugging about, I've been bugging our elder board <laughs> since February, like we gotta do this. So we're finally launching it today, I'm super excited. Um, so then here's a list of the, the gifts that were included on the assessment. You'll notice there's a couple of gifts missing from the spiritual gifts list that are clearly outlined in scripture. I told a couple of people I was going to speak on spiritual gifts. They're like, oh, are you going to bring up tongues? Are you talk about speaking in tongues? <sighs> yeah, I'm going to talk about speaking in tongues, okay? Uh, the gift of tongues is not on, on, the, on the spiritual gifts assessment because you don't need 96 questions basically to say, hey, have you ever uncontrollably spoken in a different language? Okay. <laughs> Done. Yeah, throw this away. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I make like, if, if you are, if you, you know, we're going to talk about this. I, I'm not making fun, I promise you. I, I see the gifts of speaking in tongues listed in the scripture, and we see it as an expression of the gifts for the building of, of the body of Christ in scripture, okay? Um, but healing, miracles, speaking, uh, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, those are not on the assessment, okay? And um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this right now, uh, because again, we could spend 16 to 20 weeks unpacking spiritual gifts. But let's talk about speaking in tongues. Better yet, let's let God's word talk about speaking in tongues. So Paul addresses this uh, really well in 1 Corinthians 14. I'll put it up on the screen. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Let all things, again, be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or, at the most, three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first, speaking in tongues, be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, but, uh, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Amen? Down to verse 36 real quick. Or was it from you, and I love Paul, because he just, he's, he's got that little smart aleck in him. You know, sometimes you see him writing with a smirk. Verse 36, was it from you that the word of God came? I don't remember. Remind me. Was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? <laughs> if, if anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy. Do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all these things should be done decently and in order. So we can point to scripture and say speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit, um, but God's church is divided on this. It was then, it is now, and here's the fight. Are you ready? In this corner, we have believers of the body of Christ, Christians, sold out for Christ, love the Lord. They say, we're fine with wisdom, teaching, but not tongues. Healings or miracles. And in this corner, ding, ding, we have, <laughs> if you don't speak in tongues, you're not a Christian. Okay? We've got that. Oh, and both sides are looking at scripture. That's a crazy thing here. Both sides are looking at scripture and uh, it's being interpreted differently. You ever play the game telephone when you were you know, in elementary school? You start with one message. You got 25 kids lined up. You start with one clear message. But by the end, it's completely different. And you're like, which one of you jokers in the middle like, changed this message, right? So you start with something clear, like let's just, for example, say to this first kid, God says, I love you and I'll never leave your side. Got it? Got the message? Say it back to me. God says, I love you, and I'll never leave your side, okay? But then by the end, this kid confidently says, God says, all of you will sever bees with knives. All of you will sever bees with knives? Where did, which one of you jokers? Wait, that is, and you kind of clearly see this like a bad game of telephone, okay? And uh, it is, 
it can be, it can be really frustrating. Both sides of the body of Christ look at Scripture, like Proverbs 30, 5 through 6. Check it out. Every word of God proves true. Amen. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. We love this scripture. Problem is, so do they. Problem is, so do they. And they use the exact same message. It's like a bad game of telephone, but it's going both ways. And one side says, ah, see, look. God said everything he needs to say in his word. His spirit does not manifest in speaking of tongues today. No new revelation needs to be added. In fact, those who do profess to speak in tongues are adding to scripture. God says don't do that, and if you do, he'll prove you to be a liar. Over here it says, whoa, whoa, whoa. We clearly see in God's scripture where the spiritual gift of tongues is being used, and if you take that gift out, you're taking out scripture, and... God, you're adding something to Scripture that's not there by doing that. So you're the ones that God says, uh, don't do that, and he's going to prove you to be a liar. Bing, bing, bing. 2,000 years this has been going on, right? This fight. And uh, if you're interested, it's, it's fun to watch. If you're not interested like me, it's, it's not that fun to watch because it's just, it's disunity in the body of Christ, and it's not what, not what was intended. So honestly, and then my friends over here are like, okay, Show me where the gift of tongues is being used correctly biblically. I like my friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I don't, I don't know that's biblical. <laughs> yeah, because I've, I've been there, and you know, I'm not going to call you know, certain members of my family out, but they, uh, my, for my dad's family, I remember Thanksgiving where they're there, and like, hey, we're going to pray. And it's, you know, sha-na-na, banana three times backwards, and... I, they're like, Steve, you just, just you know, use the spirit. I'm like, this is weird, man. Like, just, it's okay. God, just give us a gift of speaking in tongues. You can do it. You have faith. They're just, they're going. And me, again, I'm a smart aleck like Paul. And they're, stop praying. And they look at me like, you idiot. We're praying. And you're seeing Lion King? Really? I'm like, it's what I know. Like, I'm sorry. It's kind of on you. I, I, speaking in tongues. But so we want to say, you know, the church over here says, oh, we do it biblically. But then you, I've been to that church, and everybody's speaking in tongues. Nobody's uh, interpreting. I'm visiting. I'm having the reaction that Paul points out, and he's warning the church about, actually, in 1 Corinthians 14, 23. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues... And outsiders or unbelievers enter. Will they not say you are out of your minds? Yeah. Yeah, I will. I love Paul. So Lance and I have talked about this. We have a doctoral statement on this. We're in agreement. We want to be in line with what God's word says. So going back to 1 Corinthians 12, 11, all these, including speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues, are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each individually as he wills. This is what scripture says. Either side can argue all they want until they're blue in the face, and they probably will. But thankfully, Paul doesn't end there because we have 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Now, a lot of times we hear this at weddings, right? Love is patient, love is kind, great. But in the context, it's actually in the context of spiritual gifts. Let me show you. Paul, Paul reminds us of the paramount importance that, this gift, that these gifts be used of building up the body and that they must be done in love or else they are useless. Like, look, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. And if I have prophetic powers, gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and knowledge, okay, there's wisdom, knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, gift of faith, but have not love, I am nothing. So look at 1 Corinthians 13 in the context of spiritual gifts and how they should be used because um, no gift of God, whether it be gift of tongues, faith that moves mountains, like um, how amazing would that be? Faith that moves mountains or knowledge of mysteries has meaning, un, has any meaning unless it is accompanied by love. I saw this uh, of all things in the Cyclopedia Britannica and I wanted to share that with you today. Let me read it again. No gift of God 
whether it be the gift of tongues, faith that moves mountains, or knowledge of mysteries, has any meaning unless it is accompanied by love. That's so key. So if you're ready to find out what your gifts are, and you're ready for God to use you to build up his church, then you better be ready to make some room in your heart for other people. If you're ready to accept God's job offer for you here at Windsor Christian and to get connected to this beautiful picture that he has of a healthy body of Christ, then you gotta make room to love people. You gotta start, you know, loving people. And you can't love people if you don't know them. If you wanna be able to say, I love this church and get to know, then you get to know the church. Get to know their names. You know, if only we had a, a way to make that easy for you. If only there was some sort of sign that we could put on everyone uh, that had your names on it. Uh, It would be so great. I wish we would think of that. Um, In the back, there are some name tags. Some of you saw it when you came in. We want to do this over the next couple of weeks because this is important. We want you to get to know people's names. I know it might not go with your outfit that day. I get it. But this is important, and we just want to try this. If if even 75% of you did this in the next couple of weeks of just putting on a name tag so that other people can call you by name, you can call other people by name, this is how we get to know each other, this is how we get to connect with each other, this is how we get to love each other, right? So we're gonna be putting on those name tags for the next few weeks. And uh, I wanna share with you just our goal, again, before the end of the year, is that 75% of you can identify your spiritual gifts and be using them in the church. We got nine more weeks left until 2024, all right? Some of you are like, oh, you just made me think of Christmas shopping, Steve. Thanks a lot. Sorry for that. But we we, we we got some time here. When you fill this out, then it's our job, right? It's our job to provide those opportunities for you to use your gifts, and we have those opportunities there. Like every other church, about 20% of, the, of people, of the members of the body of Christ are doing 80% of the work. And we wanna, we wanna balance that out a little bit more. And we need you. Because that picture doesn't look as beautiful when you are not connected. When those lines aren't connected. You are part of that line. You're an important part of that line. You're what makes this church healthy. You understand? You get it? Name tags, good. Assessment, good. I can keep going. I can, no. No, let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the expressions that we see of the Holy Spirit moving through us, the evidence that we have the Holy Spirit in us. God, when we see your gifts at work, but they don't shine a spotlight on us. It's nothing for us to boast about. They shine the spotlight back to you where it belongs and all the glory be to you. So God, as we go forward as a church, as a body of Christ, as we identify with our spiritual gifts. Uh, May we be excited, Lord, to be used by you and to point the glory back to you to build up and make your church better. In your most precious name we pray, amen.